Hi, this is a panel on educating SREs. Um, my name is Craig Sebenik, and quick agenda. I'll do some quick introductions and then some uh, discussion amongst the panel. Uh, please chime in if you have questions or comments along the way. Uh, and then we'll do some just general open Q&A at the end. So we'll start out with me. Uh, again, my name is Craig Sebenik. I am currently at a startup called Matterport. Uh, we do 3D scans of mostly residential real estate at the moment. But I was at LinkedIn for several years. Uh, while I was at LinkedIn, I led several uh, programs to try and educate uh, both new and um, continuing SREs. Uh, I also participated as a mentor in the internship program a couple of times. Um, so I have a, a huge background in uh, education, uh, not just there, but also personally, and uh, a great interest in education. Also, I recently wrote a book, and if you want to know what you don't know about the subject, write a book. Um, and from that, I will turn it over to Philip from... Uh, uh, the title of the book is Salt Essentials. Uh, Salt is a configuration management system, much like Ansible, um, Chef, Puppet, CF Engine, etc. Uh, there aren't too many Sebenics in the world, so if you search for me on Amazon, I guarantee you I'll be the first hit. <laughs> um, so my name is Philip Boyle. Um, I manage a couple of production engineering teams at Facebook, uh, responsible for monitoring our um, our monitoring infrastructure and also charged with onboarding. Uh, a new acquisitions into Facebook, um, uh, integrating them into our infrastructure. Um, and I also am charged with onboarding all new production engineers into Facebook. Um, prior, prior to this, I was the SRO manager. Oh, apologies. Prior to this, I was the uh, SRO manager that Pedro referenced in his keynote at the start of the conference, who was uh, decentralized ops from the rest of engineering. So, um, yeah, that's my basic intro. And I don't have a book, um, but maybe <laughs> next year. Next year, I'm going to work on that over the next 12 months. Hello, I'm David Ma. Um, I'm pretty new to Dropbox and SRE in general, so I'm supposed to represent that person who would be educated for this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but I joined maybe 10 months ago, graduated from the University of Washington, Seattle. I did a bunch of internships trying out a bunch of different things like web dev and quality engineering and then finally SRE with Dropbox. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Whittleson. How many of you came to my talk just a few months ago? How many didn't? Boo, no. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a search SRE for Google um, and been there almost eight years. They haven't fired me yet. And uh, have you noticed that site reliability engineering, when spoken fast and with poor enunciation, sounds like cyber liability engineering? <laughs> I am a cyber liability. <laughs> okay, so the topics I want to cover are uh, kind of higher education and where it uh, basically falls short. Uh, there are great computer science degrees throughout the world. Um, and if you know a little bit about computer science history, computer science wasn't a major uh, uh, degree until the 60s. And it was a branch of applied mathematics. And now there are multiple branches within computer science. Um, so one could argue that SRE is becoming a bigger branch within computer science. So where, does, uh, where, where can we improve? on what college uh, offers. Um, and I, college I use in a very general term. I mean higher education. Um, I don't want to pigeonhole everything into a standard four-year uh, four year university degree. Next, ongoing education within a company. There are two kind of slants to this. One is uh, educating people new to your company. When you come into a company, every company has slight different twists and turns, different policies, procedures. And even if you were uh, a star SRE at Google for 10 years, you come over to Facebook, they do things differently. So how do you come up to speed on all of that stuff? And then also, if you are at Google for 10 years or at Facebook for 10 years, and tools have evolved. A tool you've been using for two years has suddenly changed or has not so suddenly changed. How do you keep abreast and how do you keep on top of these things uh, within your own company and, of course, the industry as a whole? And lastly, uh, one that's key to what I'm doing now, uh, again, I'm at a startup. I am the only SRE. Uh, in fact, uh, my coworkers don't even know what the title SRE is, so I don't use that internally. They just call me the ops guy. 
uh, which is unfortunate, uh, but it is what it is. So how do you educate devs on what is and is not important? Uh, you know, from simple things from, hey, you need to emit some basic metrics to, um, you know, hey, your logs, they send out, to, you know, uh, 10,000 messages every minute. Uh, that really doesn't help me. Um, so the more devs and SREs work together, easier everybody's jobs is, job is. So how do you uh, educate the other half? Um, into what we do and how they can help, uh, and then uh, the, the flip side. So we'll start out with uh, David, since you are the most recent, um, the, the youngest on the panel. <laughs> um, can you describe a little bit about how your degree did or did not help prepare you for SRE, and what, uh, how you got uh, interested and uh, started at Dropbox? Okay, so in, in college, I went to the University of Washington in Seattle, and I studied computer science. And the way I spent my time would be split between classes and side projects and clubs. And I felt that the classes that I took were great background for like ways to think about computer science and all, but they didn't really apply so well to, say, like site reliability engineering or even just software engineering. Like we, I don't know, talk about things like how operating systems do blah and blah, and then maybe look at a little bit of code. But then we wouldn't really build things in a way of where we would think about them as long-term projects and all. We kind of just solve problem sets and submit them. And, and I guess like that way of getting work done didn't really set me up that well. With regards to technical things otherwise, I think that um, clubs were really good for me because as a student, I guess, I didn't know I didn't know it was out there at all. So through clubs, I was able to meet a bunch of people who worked on various things and learn what else is out there. And that's kind of what powered making side projects. And I originally, I guess I tried a lot of different things to figure out what I wanted to do in industry. I started like making video games because that seemed kind of cool. And after that, well, web dev seems pretty reasonable and I tried that for a while. Um, and in my first internship, I'm um, at a company called Posterous. My mentor showed me a little diagram, or like we went to a room and he showed me the diagram of like here's the nginx and the, the hi proxy and the app servers and the data servers and like if we take these nodes down, we have fault tolerance and stuff works out well and all. And being introduced to this stuff, like man, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I'll keep this in the back of my head for the future. Um, and I guess like getting the chance to be exposed in this way to different things, so I could explore them on my own later was really the most valuable. The classes were really focused on single things as opposed to broadening me, I guess. How should I drill on this more? <laughs> um, so your internship at Dropbox. OK, so, so I did three internships. First was web dev with Posterous. Then I did quality engineering with Palantir. And then I did S3 with Dropbox. And then the work I did at Dropbox <coughs> was definitely in production, I guess. And I, I feel like if I were. I guess doing coding for S3 but without being an SRE, I wouldn't have really gotten that full experience. So the projects that I did were really coupled with production. I built the host level firewall infrastructure and thought about how to deploy it and deployed it and built the monitoring around it. And being, I guess, thrown in the deep end or like left to build this out and solve the problems on my own with guidance is really what gave me the true feel for what SREs have to do or actually think about on the job, or really guess any role being left on my own <laughs> gives me that, that experience. <laughs> or abandoned, not quite, but almost. <laughs> so Andrew and Philip, both uh, Google and Facebook have uh, internship programs. Can you discuss a little bit about how uh, SRE plays into uh, the, the global picture, and then how um, when you have an intern in SRE, what they are not able to, to do? Um, uh, so I think um, fundamentally, like as a as an industry, like we we uh, we need to take a chance on hiring new grads. Um, you know, like uh, like we know that there's definitely a sort of general productivity loss when you know trying to to train people up and 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 bring people on board. Um, but like uh, and and sometimes there's a drop off rate where people like they they do some reliability work and then they they drop back to the pure programming. But like fundamentally. Um, 
what the benefits for us is that even if they go back to a pure SWE role, that they've actually got some insight into like what it is to be a production engineer or a site reliability uh, engineer. At Facebook, we have a, a three-month intern project uh, um, program where we we, we uh, essentially we, we line up a bunch of intern managers locally within production engineers, a bunch of projects that we think that would be good for for new interns. We've got so much low, we, we, we really don't have enough employees. We've got so much low hanging fruit um, that we know that a, a lot of these, uh, similar to David's experience, like these are projects that will touch production. That these, this is real life impactful work that, that uh, new interns can do. So we, we bring people on board, a couple of days of orientation, and then we also sign them up with a dedicated mentor. Um, we have a very clearly defined project. We treat, th they are essentially employee with Facebook. And we, um, throughout that time, we, um, we work very closely with them, regular check-ins, weekly check-ins, and we also have the, um, uh, you know, we give them feedback in terms of the performance. We make sure that we unblock them. We make sure that they build connections through Facebook. And ultimately what we want to do is we want those, they want them to go back and uh, deliver something like that that's impactful and also that we want them to go back to their uh, universities and colleges and talking about what it is to be a production engineer on Facebook and be excited about that and tell all their all their friends so we can start to sort of like um, a lot of the times in 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 colleges and um, people don't really understand what an SRE does or a, a production engineer so the more people that we can send back with a positive experience the um, the better it is for the for the wider production engineer SRE um, grouping. A note on the going back to the universities and all. It's worked because I've converted some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Case in point. Cool. So just, just a quick show of hands. How many people here are actively trying to hire SRE-like people into their company? Of those people, how many of you keep your hand up if you are considering adding new grads? Okay. How many are not looking to hire new grads? Okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Not, not, what? <laughs> X on, X off, what? Okay, so um, a couple of different things. First of all, so um, we have a lot of interns in site reliability engineering at Google. Um, two examples come to mind for me just to show you the radical breadth of things. We place people for their skills um, and their interests, and then we hope to give them more of a broader picture for SRE while we're going. So for example, um, last summer we had one person on my team uh, interning in Zurich who um, helped write a, the user interface to a internal escalation system that now all of the SRE teams use to uh, communicate big, major issues. Um, I think it's okay to, to, to say what the name of the system is externally. It's called OMG. <laughs> Go check the OMG on this. And so they got, I know I like saying this phrase, but a front row seat to the fireworks. They got to see all of the crazy stuff that went down because they helped write the system that, um, that keeps the state on all of it. At the same time, um, I'm leading a project where we do real-time um, blocking of machine-generated queries into web search. And so we had a PhD um, named Barbara who wanted to do some uh, like mathematical models for feature classification for incoming traffic streams. So I had her implement like a Mahalanobis distance feature or a, we plotted receiver operator characteristic curves on um, how some of our spam detection was doing. A lot of breadth in there and those are just two not quite extremes but a very broad set of things that we've had our um, SRE interns work on. Um, in the, the short amount of time that we have, we don't put our um, SRE interns on call, but we make sure that they get to see all of the incidents that go down and we talk about it and we save time for talking about it. So we've had plenty of SRE interns uh, come back and say, I wanna go on call and they've gone on call faster than people who've come straight out of university without having interned with us. We, we welcome them both. Um, could I maybe make a comment about the computer science education um, yep, just yeah. a little bit? So um, I'm the um, co-chair of the Carnegie Mellon University School of Computer Science uh, long-winded group name group. Um, <laughs> and so we've actually had a lot of, we had a lot of conversations about like um, feedback from industry to help shape computer science education. And the reality is that a lot of computer science institutions have completely dropped the ball on big data and non-abstract large scale system design and this SRE thing because it wasn't invented there. Which is funny because normally you say that about big companies, it wasn't invented there. But um, there was uh, quite a bit of denial and this is not a comment on CMU or any other in specific institution. Um, what has made a big difference is that a lot of the large scale systems and big data systems companies have given back. They've contributed talks, they've given lectures, they've um, released white papers. Um, we're seeing a lot of universities now that are having basically reading clubs about um, let's go through the, I don't know, the Hadoop white or the big table white paper or this or that and figuring out things of that sort. I think it's important 
And I think it's, it's the responsibility of all of us to go back to our institutions to help open up this discussion. And you know, it's all well and good, and this is not like, I, I'm about as not anti-intellectual, double negative, as they come. So, so don't mistake this. I'm not gonna say like, don't take a class in type safety or compiler design or this or that, because that won't help you with SRE. It will. You need to be, you know, at the end of the day, the E in SRE is engineering. We are scientists and we are engineers. And we all come from different, like on my team, we have a particle physicist. <laughs> on my team, we have someone who used to be a professional photographer, right? But they all happen to like um, the reality of, of the levers and gears that we have at play um, and the scale that we're operating at. So um, there's a balance here. And um, it turns out that my route into SRE was not because of my computer science background. Like my previous job, I worked as a research scientist doing like music playlist prediction stuff at a consumer electronics company. It's because I hacked, I kicked around servers at my campus radio station. And someone said, you would be a good SRE. And I'm like, what? And then, then it happened. So, um, yeah, <laughs> magically. So, so anyway, like computer science is evolving. I think SRE has due influence on computer science. It will take a while and it would be best for all of us to push it upstream. So communicate what you're working on. Consider the, the novelties and the complexities of what you're doing. Release papers when you can. And um, uh, through communities like this, we can all approach academia and help them with some of the uh, interesting counterexamples. My, my program compiles and it type checks, so it must be perfect. Well, what if this you know photon hits some RAM in some data center somewhere? Or um, you know, having the conversation around like, you have asserts in your production code? No, that doesn't work. What if they all crash at the same time? Well, I've never thought of that. Like, there are counterexamples that S3 can provide to traditional computer science, so. Uh, yeah, interestingly enough, I actually have a graduate degree in non-computer science, uh, actually in chemistry. Um, and I just kind of evolved into, uh, which was sys sysadmin, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and then eventually just became S3. Uh, I can comment a little bit on LinkedIn's program from a couple of years ago. And we had uh, a relatively small internship program that grew, and then SRE uh, interns grew with it. In the first summer that we did it, we gave them uh, project work. The feedback we got from the interns was they didn't get enough view of what, quote, real SREs did. Um, we brainstormed various ideas and how to get them involved with on-call um, without making them be on-call, um, much to Phil's point about what we want to do is give them a, a kind of a general idea so they can go back to the universities and tell all their friends, hey, this thing called SRE is really cool. I did this cool thing at LinkedIn. And you heard about that big problem they had? Well, yeah, my mentor was actively involved with it. Um, and so they can help spread the word that way. Um, so then the following year, we tried to get them more involved, but it's an ongoing challenge to try and get them involved without them being on the front line and just being, you know, scared to death of, oh, crap, why did I do this? So, yeah, that's a, it's a tough, tough position. Um, Philip, do you want to talk a little bit about how uh, Facebook uh, integrates uh, new people into the program? Um, into uh, just in general, just bringing yeah. people on board? Yeah. Um, so fundamentally, we, we don't differentiate between, I, I guess, just make sure I'm close to this mic. We don't, <laughs> we don't differentiate between, I guess, uh, when we're onboarding new people, we don't differentiate between engineering and production engineering. We have a, we have a, um, like a, a four to eight week um, sort of uh, onboarding program for engineers and production engineers at Facebook. Uh, essentially, like your, your first week is, is, is typically, like week one is your, your general or orientation, you know, culture, uh, set up your dev server, get your environment set up. And um, week two is typically like your broader sort of infrastructure overview. So you get a sort of broad idea of how the infrastructure is set up. And then um, week three, we sort of bring you through like for if you're an engineer, you go through like here are the, 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 the various teams within engineering and also within production engineering. And then from around week four to week six, you choose your individual tracks. So like you may be interested in the engineers might drop off into um, Android development or iOS development or um, for production engineers, we have a generalist track, right, which basically covers the sort of length and breadth of what you need to, to, to know um, as a production engineer. We have a very um, structured uh, setup where like you're, you're attending classes like um, from weeks four to six, pretty much through your entire six weeks, you're attending various classes on the different parts. Like 
fundamentally what we want to do here is we want to like make sure the production engineers touch on all parts of the infrastructure. Um, we have everybody has dedicated mentor from weeks one through to six. Um, so essentially, these mentors are are handing out tasks to engineers, like very very structured production engineering type work, the type of work that you would do if you joined the production engineering team. And we also want to make sure that you build connections with other people that I throughout the company, because like as we find as we get larger, um, it's kind of more it's more challenging to figure out like who's who. Like when I when I first uh, joined, like my my manager was like I, I joined in Dublin originally, and then I I moved to the US, but. Um, when I joined first, my manager was like, here's 10 people. Here's a list of 10 people that you should go and talk to. And like, you know, as things have evolved, like that list of 10 people is now a list of like 30 people. I used to be able to just go, hey, somebody would say to me, who do I need to talk about this? And I would just go, here, you go talk to this person. But like, um, I guess over time we've evolved and, and, and moved on. But it's so fundamentally bootcamp is really important for building connections. And then from around week three to week six, we we ask people to sort of spend time with the teams that they're interested in. So like they essentially go like, they talk to the mentor, go like, look, at, I've talked to a bunch of teams, I've seen the overviews. These are the two or three teams that I'm interested in, in working with. So um, production engineers typically go out and spend a week with that, with each individual team. And um, they want to understand sort of like high, over, high, high level, like how does that team work? What are the projects they're working on? What's the team dynamic? Do I want to work with these folks in this team? Is it a good fit for me? Because fundamentally, when people come out of boot camp, we want to also like everybody in production engineer is a generalist, right? But we um, people have you know they they may be more interested in the traffic side of things, or they might be interested in mobile. So it's just trying to figure out like what is where do your skills match up with your interests, and we try to make that match at the end of the, at the end of the process. And when you exit, I guess um, your initial sort of six weeks, six to eight weeks of boot camp. You join your team, you're allocated a mentor on that team, and then each individual team has their own sort of or structured onboarding for, for each individual. It's, it's basically tailored to that individual team. And Andrew, Google does it a little bit different, right? They have more structured specifically for SRE. Yeah, so um, first week is how to set up direct deposit and fill out your IRS forms. Second week is um, general, I mean, you know, the usual, right? Don't forget where you parked on your first day. That's a bad... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So, no, uh, second week is uh, general engineering orientation, everything from revision control and bugs and readability and all, all the different language styles and interoperating as a general um, software engineer. And then uh, what we are now instituting effective this month is uh, a third week of SRE-specific education. And we kind of go through all the general things you need to know as an SRE before we then dispatch you to your team. So we talk about everything from our huge distributed grid scheduling environment to the network topology and the layout of our production network um, all the way through to some more philosophical questions uh, and answers about things like we'll, we'll take one of the We'll take one of maybe 10 most senior SREs at the company and we'll do very small batch, like pick your brain, question and answer type stuff. Talk about post-mortems, getting people excited about failure from day one, which is weird, but it's very cool, right? Um, and then uh, in week four, we, you already have met up with your manager, you already have a desk and all that stuff, but really week four is where we start, effective this month, um, the onboarding with your team. So they can focus on, here's what makes our team different, as opposed to, let me haphazardly kind of give you the general overview that I haven't given since the last newbie, which may have been several months ago, right? So um, that's kind of our, our approach for, uh, as we call our new Googlers, Nooglers, or Noogler orientation in SRE. And um, we're doing it uh, globally, uh, simultaneously. We're bringing in cohorts of SRE that all start at the same time in their various offices, but we do a combination of in-person and VC education in three sites to the remaining seven sites of where SRE started Google. And David, you came into a much smaller organization, so can you talk a little bit about uh, how you got up to speed at Dropbox? Mm -hmm. So when I interned at Dropbox, the SRE team was five or six people large. So we didn't have a large structured like onboarding program, and there wasn't really a good reason to have one for such a small size of team. So the way that I became onboarded was by working on lots of things actually in production, like change some configuration management here and there, mess with some services, add some monitoring, a lot of stuff that lets me touch things or actually be in production. Like I pretty quickly was able, like had production access and could um, like log in. My, my project was going to, or I guess there's the long-term projects and the small projects at the same time. And the long-term project was gonna be the firewall stuff. 
And I had the opportunity to, to go into production and look at how this is all set up and poke around and actually touch things. So I guess like actually being able to get in there is what got me up to speed as opposed to I guess the, this idea of classes and structured learning. I don't really know how that, that works out, I guess, though you two do. <laughs> so another part within a company, obviously, is ongoing education, uh, specifically for tools specific to your company. Uh, I can talk a little bit about what I tried to do at LinkedIn. What we tried to do was uh, we created a single day a month, um, which uh, a lot of things at LinkedIn uh, use in in the title. Um, so it was called Esri Learning Day. Um, you can laugh all you want. Uh, so th the goal was it was kind of like a mini conference. And so there would be uh, a topic on config ma management, there would be a topic on deployment, there would be a topic on Git. Um, when I first got to, to LinkedIn, it was uh, all SVN um, with the, a little bit of Git. And over the course of several years, this obviously went very much the other way. And one of the concerns, especially for people who had been there a while, is I don't know Git, what am I supposed to do? So this was an opportunity to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, we actually had somebody from GitHub come in and uh, give training, and he was fantastic, but it was a little bit short. And the idea was there would be several of these one-hour sessions and things that were changing rapidly. So at the time this started, um, for example, the deployment system was undergoing a, a major restructuring. And so this one, this uh, the deployment talk would be given, say, every other month, whereas something else that was relatively stable, like our config management system, which had gone through a major change a year earlier, um, that one would be uh, done, say, every six months or maybe once a quarter because the change wasn't that big. Since all these sessions were video recorded, they could just go back and look at it and say, yeah, that's pretty much the same. Whereas the deployment system, again, if you went back and looked at the session from two months ago, it's like that is totally different than what we're doing now. So, uh, David, can you talk about how you keep new people up to speed now, now that you're uh, uh, an oldie at uh, Dropbox? Oldie, <laughs> not quite. Um, but one thing that we've been doing a lot lately that I've been trying to participate in a lot is, I guess maybe we're like way behind the curve on like Google and Facebook, but S3 deep dives are a recent thing for us. Like we pretty casually, but at the same time formally, it's on our calendars and all. We gather and people demo off stuff. So I'm working on a new automation framework it's actually an FBAR clone I guess but I wanted to show this off to the rest of the team and start to sell them on like using this and step them through making remediations in Dropbox so for the S3 deep dive two weeks ago we all gathered and I did show them all this and they have questions about how it works and and they have needs as customers of mine I guess um, and that's how we kind of have spread a bit um, a bit of the knowledge then otherwise I guess at least with regards to my team, the way we're trying to get knowledge around or this tribal knowledge of sorts is to not, is to avoid, I guess, people being like strict solo owners of systems. So I used to be the primary owner of a system in our team called The Watcher. And no, pretty much no one else knew about this system or like all the internals and Nobody all. Nobody else was watching The Watcher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. And I could have continued to be the solo owner, but instead I handed it off to another member of the team and then started to tackle some of the stuff he was responsible for, and that way we kind of shared the knowledge there. Just, I feel pretty strongly about learning by doing and like getting into the details. And if we can just have people touch a lot of different stuff and work on many different things, then they'll be able to learn about all of it. Andrew, what about uh, Google? How do you keep people up to speed on you know, especially a large organization with so many sets of tools that are going to be specific to different um, types of SRE. You know, I think an important thing is to have, is to lower the bar to entry for a new tool. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I like my existing tools, why should I change things? But if there are shared gains to be made, um, demonstrating that in the clearest and most succinct way is, I think, extremely valuable. And again, this goes to more of an interpersonal than technical sort of challenge. So case, case uh, in points, um, several years ago, let's call it, Five years ago at Google, we completely changed the way we do uh, the, our major tooling around rollouts. But the first instantiation of this rollout tool was search. And 
it worked for us. But why would anyone else change? And so uh, I lobbied very hard to make sure that we had uh, like a dummy service that anyone could do a fake rollout against. So you could play with the whole thing before having to set it up. I think sometimes the, the, the death of major tooling is that hello world in whatever that tool is, is too, too big, too arcane, too whatever, and ill-documented. And so I actually went to the dev team and I said, okay, I've stood up like a hello world service. All it does is serves 200s and 400s all day. Um, roll it forward, roll it backwards, you know, do all these different things and let anyone poke at it. And that, I think, helped with the adoption curve there. I think it's, it's very important to have hands-on examples too, um, whether it's like, like that. For example, I teach a class on how all of the load balancing infrastructure works at Google. And for some people, especially on the software engineering side of things, like that's, you know, it's magic. So we set up a dummy service and we say, okay, well, what happens if you drain all of the backends except one? You know, or what happens if you uh, turn on cost reporting and, and you change the, the nature of the queries being sent to it. But I make sure that at the end of the class, everyone can say I've, just, it'll be a bigger deal to some people than others, but everyone can say like I've drained a Google service or I've undrained a Google service. Or um, for example, uh, the tooling we have around preventing denial of service attacks. I make sure that every student at the end has instituted a block on Google search, which is if you search for Andrew says it's okay to block me and then a random number I give them, it denies you externally for that query. <laughs> that way people can go home and be like, take a look at this, this is what I learned today. <laughs> Andrew says it's okay to block me 632, denied, right? Uh -huh. So that, that way people don't say, oh, I can't learn this, I've heard it's difficult. Well, no, you, you, you did a block, right? And, and having that socializing around your tools is an important way to get the shared gains. Uh, if you're gonna write a tool and it's gonna save the universe and then no one uses it, you're kind of boned, right? So at Facebook, there, uh, one thing you mentioned was uh, the distinction between SRE and dev is actually relatively small. Um, so this helps kind of spread the knowledge between you know, production, uh, production engineering and development. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how that works? Yeah, so I, I guess um, in production engineering, and, and uh, like we're essentially embedded with the, with the uh, engineering team. So like we're, uh, we don't really make that big a distinction between SWEs and production engineers in the, in, the, in the various teams we support. It's sometimes in, in particular teams, it's actually uh, difficult to distinguish between who is an actual production engineer and who's actually a SWE in the individual teams. It's like um, they cross over so, so much, but we, what we try to do to make sure uh, is we, we, we have a, a shared roadmap and a, a common framework in terms of what we're, we're going to support. Um, traditionally, SWEs are more focused on the, I guess they're focused on the products and the features that they're trying to roll out. And traditionally, production engineers are focused on the reliability and scalability of the platform. Um, but these both go hand in hand and, and the, the product itself can be successful if both these teams don't work together. Um, so uh, fundamentally, while production engineers are more focused maybe on putting together the scaffolding, um, we do share the on-call rotation. Um, there's no real distinction between uh, like, uh, you know, production engineers are the opposite side of the house and Swedes are the other side of the house. We, we essentially work hand in hand. Um, I think the important part here is like, uh, particularly when we engage with new production engineer or with new suite teams, is that we don't go in and go like, hey, um, why the hell are you doing it, it like that? Um, and likewise, we don't expect the, the Swedes to sort of say like, hey, um, you guys are, are, are ops guys. So we, 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 um, we work very closely together. It's, uh, it all depends as well on, on the maturity of the service as well and if, whether it's software engineering team has had production engineers before. Um, so if it's our first engagement with a, with a software engineering team, we spend a lot of time explaining what the role is of, of production engineers and also um, showing that value that we can, that we can add um, to the suite. So I am currently at a, like I said, a very small company. I am the only <coughs> SRE, the only ops person. And one of the challenges I've had is uh, I actually took over from a operations person who came from a very large company and really apparently likes classical operations. So it's been hard to uh, educate the devs saying, hey, you know what, you guys should deploy your own code. Uh, you should own your own code. You should own your own configuration. Uh, you should have access to prod. Uh, getting that, um, uh, that culture shift within the company uh, has proven to be a lot more difficult than I expected. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have a very young uh, senior dev 
who is a, a big fan of this, and he, he is actually helping uh, to try and push this um, um, ideology throughout the rest of the company. Um, but that is, it's, it's been very difficult. Um, if anybody has any comments or questions about uh, you know startups and how, especially if you have somebody who's been there a while um, and he pushed forth the, this classic kind of uh, throw it over the wall to operations, I'll do whatever it takes to make this work, don't worry about it, I've got it. Where you know, if you just involve the developer, uh, some of these problems can be handled so much faster. Um, if you guys have any comments, um, some of this is obviously uh, a little bit more ingrained at larger companies because th these topics were tackled you know years and years ago. Um, if you have any general questions uh, at this point, I, I put all our names up to, on the board in case you. Um, forgot from what half an hour ago when we started. Who am I again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have a question specifically for the NCGs. Um, so, as you say, we we don't have that uh, very good education system which can, prepares you for being an SRE and how it feels to be being an SRE. So, how how do you provide the flexibility for uh, to the NCG that which specific embedded as group he should go, let's say, if I want to go in Google and I say, okay, I want to join search team, but then I found that, hey, YouTube team sounds more interesting. Because to me, everything is new. So how do you provide that flexibility to educate the folks and, and if, if they want to switch, they can. So like maybe a concern here is that you might over specially specialize and over train someone for one team and then they, they don't feel like they have the mobility to go to a different team? Uh, on, on one side, you can say that, but on the other side, you may find something else interesting. Sure. Because at the, when you are new, you don't know what you're going to do. That's why. It's not about the person who is exper he has experience in industry. He's sure. not going to have that question in mind because he knows. Well, so I think um, if, you, if you're in a situation where you have multiple ESSER teams working on maybe related, maybe not projects, it's really important to socialize with them, it turns out. Um, like, we have a... a kind of a thinking and drinking sort of exercise that, that many of us do where we get together and we, we call it um, ops review. And we talk about what blew up last week. Um, and we have a couple of rules about it, right? First of all, it's social. Second of all, it's jovial. Um, you never talk crap about another team behind their back. So uh, if you're gonna talk about an outage, at least one person from that, uh, that group needs to be there to, to talk about things. And it's, it's really cool because you learn about the differences in the teams. And, and you uh, internalize that. And so Randall, who's here, is, a, is kind of a lead of the ops review thing, and he has some, some good uh, things to say about it, for sure. But I would say, like, don't put the blinders on and only think about your, your specialty part of the stack. Um, where possible, ask other people, like, well, I have this thing here. Do you have anything that looks like this? Or what tool do you use for rollouts, or this or that? And it can be very enlightening. And so maybe you'll find out that other teams are more interesting to you based on their mission, based on their, what they provide for their, the people that use their service, whatever the case may be. But keeping an open mind about um, those other teams can be cool. And also it works in reverse. Maybe someone else will think your team's cooler. <laughs> cool. Thanks for asking. Uh, can I just jump in there on the mobility question? Um, I think uh, one of the common things that come up for us with new production engineers is like they've got like they're they're in their onboarding and they spend three weeks sort of like trying to figure out which team and then they you know what uh, you know they join a team and they're not sure it's really uncertain. So like one of the things we tell is like we're we're really focused on mobility because we want people to move around. We want people to have different experiences. We want people to learn more. So um, we actively encourage um, people uh, in production engineer to move around every 12, 18 months. Um, so uh, there's different vehicles we use here. Like we can, you can go and, and do a hack a month with a different team. So essentially, it's like, hey, um, you go talk to the other manager. You talk to your own manager and you say, like, um, have you got a project that I can work on solid for a month? And you can go hack a month with that team, and you can make decisions at the end of that month. You're just going to go back to your own team, or you may say, hey, like, I really enjoy what I was working on there, and I want to stay with that team. And then, so like. Um, on the flip side, as a production engineer manager, like we're eternally recruiting boot campers, right? So it's uh, so it's 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 a double-edged sword for us, but it's really important for us to have the mobility. So you can do a hack a month, or you can do a hack a quarter. So like, but essentially, we're we're constantly in, uh, encourage people to move around every 12, 18 months, so they get new experiences. They can also bring that experience to bear on other teams. What role do like professional educators play in, in structuring these programs, or do you just have educationally minded SREs doing all this 
this material creation and lesson planning. All right. <laughs> can you, can, sorry, can you, yeah. You so I can speak a little bit to uh, what LinkedIn did. Uh, LinkedIn had a relatively large uh, education program throughout the entire company. Uh, ESSERY did not have a formal one. Um, I worked a lot with uh, um, one guy who was specifically in charge of education uh, for engineering. Um, so uh, I got a lot of assistance from him. Um, and that's how I helped develop some of the programs um, I did at LinkedIn and some of the ones I planned on uh, rolling out that just never came out. So uh, just, you know, basically do you look to other professionals who aren't, aren't SREs, but who are like professional educators? Yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's mainly, I guess it's fundamentally a lot of the, a lot of the courses that we offer and a lot of the training sessions we do are, I guess, from the individual, um, a, a lot of it is from the individual production engineers and the individual Swedes that are actually um, doing the courses. But we also encourage um, people taking the, the courses or joining in. We have labs that we have so that people can run through it on their own time, etc. And we also encourage people to sort of like help us, right? Sort of go like, hey, this could be better. And we, we are always constantly evaluating the, the individual classes and we encourage people to actually update the labs, etc. And just, um, but it's pretty much, it's all, it's sort of all ground up. So even at Facebook's like multi-week, you know, lesson structure, you don't necessarily have people whose title is like, you know, trainer that uh, runs those things. No, we don't have, I guess uh, within engineering, we don't, or in production, we don't have, we don't, fundamentally we don't have titles. We don't really actively encourage titles uh, within the org because we want people to sort of like uh, go work with people who they see as role models and, and we don't want people to be afraid to go and talk to somebody because they feel like, oh, that's a senior person in a particular role. We want to make sure that people can actively go and, and, and go talk to people regardless of who they are, what they do. Um, the only, I guess, the only functions that probably have very structured titles and all is maybe an L&D function who are sort of rolling out doing very broad courses like crucial conversations, situational leadership, which are modules which we typically encourage all our mentors um, and production engineer mentors to go on these specific courses because we encourage and um, we also want to encourage a lot of leadership um, within the uh, individual production engineering. And I can also speak to this. Um, at Google, we, have, we hire for our engineering education, we hire instructional designers, we hire tech writers, we hire program managers. In SRE, we've hired our first instructional designer this month and dedicated for our efforts. We're currently going through and replumbing um, kind of the story arc of how we teach people the first several classes, um, updating a lot of things and so forth. So, um, but at the same time, all of the instructors are either subject matter experts for the classes they are teaching or are subject matter experts on something. We find that we don't need the most hyper-specific SRE about load balancing to teach the load balancing class, but we do need someone who can answer principled questions about what it is to be an SRE in this context. Um, so that's definitely a big thing of what we do. And also, um, depending on what size of company you're at, uh, depending on how what level of obsession your employees have with their job ladder and their performance characteristics. Um, at Google, making no commentary about that, um, we have actually just modified the job ladder for SRE to include aspects of education as something that is optional, but equally valued as every other value we have on our job ladder. So um, you can uh, be rewarded for your work by scaling, as I like to say, humans just as much as servers. And that's an official part of what we do. Do you feel like the role for educators or people with education like expertise or focus would expand uh, along with company size or if it's more of a cultural choice? I think it's a bit of both, uh, to be honest. But um, the, the need is just very great. We, you know, I think uh, we tried. There are two bad anti-patterns I see in SRE. One is um, heroism. Like, I'm going to take all of this on myself which is a definite sign of hoarding knowledge or not, not teaching things or being so overwhelmed that you can't spend the time to bootstrap people around you. Um, and the other one is uh, perceived mysticism of production. It's magic, I can't possibly touch it, which is also a sign of maybe education is demystification. Both of those things are crucial, um, whether you are a, a small or large company. Um, and there are lots of people who enjoy doing it. It's not for everyone mind you, which is why it's not a requirement for us, but uh, it's, it's a rewarding thing. Those who can do and teach. Thank you. Hi. So I'd like to troll the panel a little bit. Wow. Um, <laughs> hopefully productively. 
Uh, so everybody has talked about, um, you know. Can you get a little closer to the mic? Yeah, everybody has talked a, a little bit about how, um, uh, you know, SWEs on various teams are almost indistinguishable from SREs and everything. So uh, do you have the histological analysis to show that background in SRE uh, is not a predictor of future success? Uh, and if you do, what is the difference between a system developer who cares and an SRE? You want to take that? Oh, over? snap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you want to you know whether uh, previous background in SRE is an indicator of success in SRE, among many things? Previous background outside of SRE. So, like, wow. I was a kernel dev before I came to Google, right? Other people have been through chemistry. Some are nuclear physicists, right? Um, the, the data that I have seen suggests that we need people who are scientists and engineers as a first goal and people who are willing to learn about the nitty gritty of trivia of what we do in the arbitrary systems that we have as a second goal. You know, uh, how many people have heard of the, the trainer curve? So, you know, okay, right. So the idea being that at least at Google, we, we look to hire people who either have like uh, fascinating software development backgrounds in whether it be kernels or it be, you know, machine learning, which it seems like everyone assumes is what we hire for, even though it's only a small fraction, damn it, and et cetera. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you do machine learning? Shut up. And, um, or on the other axis, like I was a badass sysadmin or system, uh, large scale system administrator. Um, the, the key indicator to success that I found is ability to shed that previous skin and learn both from the ground up and be humble about it, right? Because um, you don't really hire people that are both, like they're wild unicorns. And if, if you find them, you hire them. But, um, it really is that flexibility to shift one way or the other to become good at both that I, I find is the most successful SREs. But I'm curious what other people think too. <laughs> Hire unicorns, the end. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, like we, you know, we, we, look for, we look for a generalist skill set right across the board. Um, and we also recognize that, you know, uh, like not everybody, like some people are very deep in one specific area, right? So like, you know, when we, when we hire people into Facebook, like we don't, we, we naturally want people to have the sort of broad depth uh, across like sort of um, architecture, uh, you know, on the coding side and also on the system side. But we, there, there are individuals who are a lot deeper in one specific area and they dive into that. So I had a uh, coworker once tell me that uh, SREs are uh, programmers with severe OCD. Um, so I am currently uh, hiring uh, like everybody else. And uh, one of the things I look for is definitely some programming background. We've had a, a bunch of, res I've had a bunch of resumes come through which are you know, pretty heavy and kind of classic sysadmin. I've used these tools, I've developed those, um, sorry, no. Key. Uh, I've used these tools, I've expanded those tools, but they don't really talk about um, their programming experience. Um, I know Nagios, I know Ganglia, I know PagerDuty, I know blah, blah, blah. That doesn't help me. If you can't automate um, you know, 10 machines, when we get to 1,000, what are you gonna do? You're gonna log into 1,000 machines. So one of the big things I look for is some amount of OCDness and um, caring about data. Right, uh, you can't solve a problem if you can't uh, see it. So, um, so some amount uh, of that, uh, as well as some definite programming experience. Um, I, I think that's often uh, undervalued um, in our job. Can't say much about like historical data I have, <laughs> um, but at least with regards. So I've been working a bit on hiring new grads, or like how we find them, get them interested in actually being SREs, uh, I actually like end up doing pre-sell calls with SWE, people interviewing for SWE, try to steal them over. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for new grads, they tend to not have any background of like being a sysadmin already. So there's a large focus on, I guess, their first principles or the ways they can think about stuff and put it together even if they've never seen it before. Um, we care about it a lot, though it's not like I have historical data that proves it all. Uh, one more small comment, um, and this goes to uh, the comment earlier about being able to move around. Um, I have worked with people who 
uh, struggled uh, as an SRE in a very specific role. They moved over to another role, uh, another specific SRE job, and they just flourished. Whether it was for uh, a change in the, the basic structure, some of the positions I worked with uh, dealt with a significant number of devs um, for a bunch of little services. Um, other roles uh, dealt with a very small number of devs for some very, very significant services. So, you know, sometimes our personality doesn't lend themselves to one specific SRA job. Um, and you just have to give them the opportunity to move around, to experience other things. And maybe something just hits them uh, the right way. And it could be something as simple as uh, a good manager or a good mentor or a good team member. Um, so all kinds of things can definitely affect the productivity uh, of a single person. So uh, my question is actually somewhat related to what you just touched on, Craig, and it goes back to Philip, what you were talking about of sending all the SWEs through like a similar boot camp and then having them kind of pick their teams. Uh, that's quite a bit different than my experience at LinkedIn where we kind of pre-allocate people into teams before they even set foot on campus. So I wanted to ask like how do you, what if there's like teams that just nobody wants to join? Or like what if there's like the cool team? <laughs> like, like do you, is there any kind of central supervision over that or you just you just let people go wherever we might gently encourage people <laughs> um yeah like i think uh, i think one of the things here is we i, I guess it, you know it's it's challenging like yeah there's some teams where but like we have this sort of like we have this uh, you know this general pipeline of production engineers coming in and you have these peaks and troughs right so like you know like you, sometimes you have production engineers coming in and they're like uh, you know, as soon as the manager mentions Java, they're like, no, no, I'm out, I'm out, right? So, um, you know, that's two teams knocked off. But like, uh, like fundamentally, I think that um, over time, you are going to like we, what I've typically found is it might take a little bit longer for 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 individual teams to hire, but eventually, the uh, the right person and the right uh, with the right interest and the right skill set will come through the door. Um, but yeah, we do gently, I guess, encourage people like, hey, to explore this opportunity a little bit more. Um, but fundamentally, we we um, we we make you know people get the choice to choose which team they want to join. Um, it's really down to the individual. Does that does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but like, do you ever find some teams just are perpetually like shorthanded or? Like the manager is always complaining they need more people, but nobody joins. I, I, what I typically find is in, in production engineer that every manager is always complaining <laughs> they're over under resourced. <laughs> there's never, I, I don't think there's any manager that's going to say, hey, I don't have enough, uh, I, 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 I have enough people, um, please don't give me any more. Uh, typically, um, we find that if there's a boot camp or this uh, production engineer interested in joining a team, um, managers will, will not turn them away. That, that absolutely doesn't happen. Hi, I found it um, really interesting, some of the really sophisticated uh, training programs uh, you guys have. I'm um, just speaking for myself, uh, I had absolutely like no SRE training when I was hired. Um, and like the first like three or four months, I felt like absolutely useless because I was just kind of like working on like side projects. And I was like, you know what, like just put me on call. Um, we'll see what happens. Hopefully we'll still be up. Um, <laughs> and um, like honestly though, like that trial by fire, like by far, like I learned more in like like one day than I did like the entire previous time, right? Like being forced to like stare into the sun and hopefully be able to like still see afterwards. Um, like so, I'm wondering like since we're like moving so fast, we're evolving so fast, we can't really maintain this set of training. Um, and like develop these programs you guys have, like what do you think is a good strategy for a smaller team or a smaller company for training? I think everything is about balance, right? Um, you can only spend so many cycles on, dare I say, the overhead of education, right? At the same time, you have to understand that the longer term play is to, is to more broadly prepare people because, and I'm not speaking to your case in specific, but we've seen plenty of people who have come in, have not had a lot of training, and then rather than rage quit, Rage went nuclear with like, put, give me the pager. That's it, I'm doing this, right? And, and you run the risk of um, learning a lot about that specific thing and nothing else because of that. Um, so I think, I think you have to balance it, right? Like that, that, that in, like forged in the fire sort of learning is absolutely fantastic, but like, why couldn't you have gotten that earlier, right? That's the real, that's the real crux of things. And so balancing, balancing it so that it's like, well, give me something like what's going on or tell me, like I wanna get involved in shadowing the page. 
um, in an earlier month, I think, would be the, the right balance for a smaller team. Um, and because I would, I would suspect that you are someone in your similar situation would not have said on day, if you had known on day two that you would not get more formal training and, and eventually you would just kind of, your, 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 your timer would expire in three months and you'd say, okay, fine, put me on call. I doubt that on day th two or three you would have said, put me on call because I don't want to sit here for three months. Mm -hmm. Right? It, part of it is just the fact that you got more comfortable with the environment, I would imagine. Yeah, no, it's interesting you would say that. We're actually considering moving towards basically as soon as someone gets hired, they're just immediately shadowing. Um, so that, like, like, that way you get to see the whole view of the infrastructure. So, interesting. Cool. So, if you were at uh, Andrew's talk, um, one of the things I plan on doing with uh, the new hire, number two SRE, um, is uh, a documentation. Uh, that would definitely be a good idea. So we have very little documentation, almost none. Um, and the documentation kind of serves two purposes. One, they have a, a much better idea of what's going on, but also it gets them introduced to the lead developers on the key projects, because um, there's only a couple for us. So it, it gets kind of uh, some face time. We have somewhat the opposite problem. We have like lots of documentation, but we like move so fast that it just, gets out of date and it's like almost impossible to curate. So one of the things that came up in Andrew's talk was, uh, hey, is this correct? Please fix it, you have a week. Let, let me know what you come up with. Oh no, they're introducing lies into the documentation. Yeah. I'll help them fix yeah. it. Right. <laughs> yes. Cool. Right, thank you. Like when we, when we originally started up the site reliability operations team, like fundamentally one of your like in the first six weeks when we had, we had this sort of six weeks of onboarding initially, so it was like four years ago. And, and one of the responsibilities for the person that was, that was going through this was like, you, you have to update the wiki, right? Like it's fundamentally like, yeah, we've done that too. It's yeah. like our way of cheating. So we don't have to do it. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But fundamentally it's the, the, the next person up is like, he's on the hook for, for keeping this up to date. Right. Uh, okay. So we're running out of time. So this will be the last question. Um, Okay, so a much more sort of tactical question about like education. So in the area of like prioritization, how do you guys educate people about how to prioritize correctly, make sure the work they're working on is impactful? The typical failure mode I see of like infrastructure engineers, including SREs, tends to be they like to work on very large scope projects, they like to just go do work, and then it's like they're never done, so that project never launches. How do you actually get them to prioritize and launch and like say this is actually, and, and show that impact directly? Uh, I'd, I'd like to take this one. I've seen, let me characterize what you, you said as taking the longer moonshotty kind of approach, and then we'll see what happens. I've also seen the opposite, which is I'm new here, and there's a bunch of low-hanging fruit, so I'm just going to keep doing the low-hanging fruit over and over and over again. And then eventually someone's like, what are we, well, you're really good at the first week of this job. <laughs> right? Like, 52 weeks later. And um, both of those are, are dangerous, right? You know, ask yourself, is what I'm doing just treading water or treadmilling or whatever? Um, you want to, and I, I used some of this language in my previous talk, but you want to be able to build a, a bigger and more badass exoskeleton around you. Right? Like, no, like, go away or I'll replace you with a small shell script, as opposed to, I enjoy writing small shell scripts. <laughs> right? So um, consider that, right? Uh, look around at the SRE team you join or the SRE team that you are growing and figure out where is the toil coming in, right? Like, you remember the... Some of you may remember the I Love Lucy episode with like the chocolate factory and it's like everything goes out of control and it spills over. If that is what your like ticket queue or your operations or your interrupts looks like or you're alerting, what is the root cause of that? Because that's a big impact and you can measure that. You can say like we had X number of escalations last quarter and now we have 0.2 X. Um, and I did that because I rolled out this thing here, I wrote this tool and it saved my team. And that only, not only builds trust within your team, but respect. Like, wow, you saved us from ourselves. So the rest of us can't do that boring, methodical shell script running work, damn it. Right, I'll have to go do something cool instead. I think one of the other obvious uh, answers would be a, uh, a strong manager or mentor, right? Somebody who can sit back and say, you know what, he continues to do the first week really, really well, and it's been two years. You know, maybe I should give him another challenge. Um, and you know, to some degree, it has to be the person you know, stepping up to the plate and saying, you know what, um, I am ready for a bigger challenge. 
um, and then somebody needs to give it to him, um, whether it's him or her uh, looking for it directly or somebody kind of guiding them, especially for somebody younger who, who might feel a little uncertain. It's like, you know, I'm not sure if I'm really ready for it. It's like you, you're not going to know until you just completely dive in. I think like uh, at Facebook, like one of the things that guiding principles for us is like one of our core values and like I've worked in previous companies where I couldn't tell you what the core values are because they just didn't resonate with me. But one of the things that one of our core values is focus on impact. So fundamentally, when, when we go to work on something and, and when I do this even in my own role as a manager, is like fundamentally like what is it that I'm trying to achieve um, and what is it I'm trying to, to do here? But like also there's different levels, like you know, we have different expectations for for different engineering levels. So like we have an expectation that you will just do tasks, right? You know, somebody will at a particular level we you will you will just like mow through tasks, right? And the next level you're like you're gonna like you're gonna run the project and then the next level you're just gonna say, hey, 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 hey Phil, here is the project that I'm gonna do. Is that does that look good? So it's it's really fundamentally a, um, a focus and impact is 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 key. Okay, well, uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I can't speak for everybody else, but I'll be around for a while, so if you have more questions, um, just uh, stop me and ask away. Thank you.